Good morning. It's a real pleasure for me to uh, lead a conversation today between Admiral Mike Mullen and General Stanley McChrystal. Uh, Admiral Mullen is the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and he held that uh, position for two terms from 19, 2007 to 2011. He's currently senior advisor uh, to Providence Equity. And General Stanley McChrystal is the former commander of US troops in Afghanistan and commander of uh, Joint Special Operations, among um, other assignments. Uh, and he is currently serving as a professor uh, at Yale University. Well, I think that this is a very timely conversation uh, today. We've got so much going on in the world, it's almost hard to uh, find the time to cover all of the uh, crises that are unfolding. But uh, we've re read in the newspaper uh, in the last 24 hours about uh, uh, very serious riots in uh, Baghdad. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we have a deteriorating situation again in Syria. Um, we have a Middle East in crisis. Um, ISIS has taken its fight on the road. Uh, Europe is facing an unprecedented refugee crisis. North Korea, uh, we've been told, uh, has enough fissile material for 20 bombs. Uh, China's flirting with confrontation in the South China Sea. Uh, Russia and NATO um, are <clears throat> on perhaps a collision course in the Baltics. And uh, Russia, of course, um, serves as a um, uh, uh, an issue for us in Syria. Um, and then, of course, we've got um, all sorts of events unfolding in Latin America uh, and other parts of the world. So I think it's a, it's a great pleasure to have you both here to offer your perspectives. Uh, let me just start with a general um, question, a kind of scene setter. Uh, we're in the middle of one of the most remarkable, I think I can say that, uh, political campaigns we've had in a very, very long time. Um, the, uh, the word out there is that America doesn't have a strategy for these unfolding crises. Uh, many people are calling into question uh, the importance of diplomacy and military action. And uh, in the absence of a strategy, critics say, uh, that uh, America has lost its way. I was wondering, um, Admiral Mullen, if you wouldn't mind maybe starting our discussion here with your perspective on, on this general situation. Well, thank you, Susan, and, and thanks for being here and all you and your family uh, do and have done over a significant part of the history in our country and that you still are very involved with that. We really appreciate that. Uh, I think there's no one I talk to that isn't concerned about uh, where our country is uh, and how it sits in the world as the world continues to unfold. Uh, when I look at the geostrategic landscape, uh, and we talked about Iraq this morning and uh, Syria. Obviously, we, we have uh, rising challenges in Libya. And as I've looked at the Middle East, you know, I think we're roughly 15 years into what is a 50-year run in the Middle East. I don't think it's going to solve itself overnight. Uh, uh, and that we will have continued very specific, intense challenges uh, associated with that. Uh, and they continue to evolve, and they have to be addressed. I don't think that we can turn away from that in any way, shape, or form. My friends in the Middle East are worried about America looking away uh, and that, that uh, sort of solve your own problems. Uh, it's really not uh, in our interest. And I think it actually is in our strategic national interest to be engaged in that part of the world. Uh, despite the fact uh, oil is where it is, despite the fact we're less dependent, uh, et cetera, we, and I'm someone that comes from a perspective of you know, thriving economies globally actually help everybody, uh, and investments in the, along those lines really make a difference. And thriving economies also generate a more secure environment. So while we might uh, be less dependent on oil, we're certainly not controlling the price of oil, and we won't for a long period of time. So we are dependent in ways on, in that part of the world. And then as you've seen it roll over the last three or four years, literally through Syria into Europe, the crisis it is inexplicable to me that we could have 8 million refugees, a half a million people die, and we haven't, as global leaders, this isn't just the United States, figured out a way to start to stem that. So we can't look away, and our friends in that part of the world, including in Europe, are wondering if we are. Uh, if you go to the other side of the world, uh, a rising China, a constructive rising China is important. Uh, I'm actually encouraged because we're so indebted to each other 
uh, that somehow that debt, that linkage will bring political leaders to a point where they'll figure out a way to not generate a massive conflict. Uh, I think we need to depend on our friends in this time, and that, you know, th that's a value-based uh, discussion, those uh, friends of ours in Europe and other parts of the world. And what's always, what, what, what all, and, and, and just a, one more comment about Europe, uh, on the top of my list in terms of threats, it's, it's Russia and Putin. Uh, uh, he's leading a country at the plus 80 percent popularity. He has strategic nuclear weapons, which we thought we'd pretty much put to bed. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of options. He's building his military. He's got a lousy economy. He's got terrible demographics, terrible infrastructure. Uh, and I think the amount of trade the United States does with Russia is 2 or 3 percent. Someone told me years ago that if the two of us disappeared, we'd have no linkage. We wouldn't miss each other. That's a very dangerous set of circumstances. And I think we need to engage him uh, and figure out a way, because he's going to vote. We need him for Syria. We need him for Iran. We need him politically in the world. Uh, and I worry about him becoming more and more isolated. Uh, and this conversation then almost completely ignores what goes north and south of us. For our whole life, we've been an east-west country, and yet there's an, a lot of dynamic opportunities in Latin America. Uh, you've got a continent of Africa that's coming, and it's going north, and it's coming west uh, that we just can't look away from. So the challenges are really, I think, enormous. Yeah. General? Well, in, in, Susan, in your nice introduction, you didn't mention that I was, uh, used to work for Admiral Mullen, <laughs> and uh, I was his chief of staff, and that's when I started drinking in the morning. Uh, <laughs> but actually, I'm, I'm honored to be here with a mentor and a man I admire, and Susan, a lady who's just done so much. I, I think the thing, I agree with everything that Admiral Mullen said. You know, there's He this, always says that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is this great thirst to simplify the problem, to say, okay, it's a very complex problem. Let's simplify it so people can understand it, and let's get a workable solution that, that can be brought down to a couple sentences. And what I would say is that is a fool's errand. It is a complex problem. It is a complex set of problems like a Gordian knot that are intertwined. We are not going to solve the Mideast. We are not going to solve China. What we are going to do is, for the rest of our lives and our children's lives, our grandchildren's lives, as history has always been, we are going to manage constantly changing situations, and we are going to always struggle to understand them. And even the, the closest players in it won't understand them. So I think that one of the things we've got to do is just not give in to the temptation to think that there's one thing to solve a problem that we can get it. Well, one of the things I think is particularly intriguing about this time frame is that we are facing an array of challenges uh, during a period of diminishing resources. Um, we've always been able in the past to count on uh, the taxpayers' goodwill and uh, Congress's willingness to write a check. Uh, what is this going to do to our military capability uh, under these circumstances? Well, I said a few years ago that uh, quite to a lot of people's surprise when asked about what the number one threat to our country was, I said it was our debt. Uh, and that actually is still at the top of my list. And so we can talk about all these things, but if we can't get healthy fiscally, uh, our options just continue to recede. Uh, and I think uh, in 10 years, uh, interest on our debt's the third biggest part of our budget, just to give you an example. And you have to be able to pay for this stuff. Uh, and inside that, you clearly need to be able to resource the national security establishment. And it's not just the Pentagon, because I've always been a pretty strong advocate for, for uh, an increased, uh, well-focused, effective budget with the State Department. I'd rather do this diplomatically than militarily. Uh, actually, I've come through 15 years where we've done too much militarily and not enough diplomatically. And I'd like to flip that over uh, that doesn't mean, I, they, they actually work together. One is dependent uh, on the other. So I'm, I mean, from that perspective, I think we do need to get our own house in order. Uh, I think this election speaks to a lot of that as well. And the inability for Washington, and I'm, uh, I, I don't like this, but I sort of came from Washington the last uh, dozen years or so in the military. I mean, the American people are fed up with Washington, fed up with what Washington has been unable to do to make their lives better. Uh, and I think we all have to figure out, in the outcome of this election, how to 
uh, get at that uh, growing gap between those who have and those who have not. When I was a young officer, I was in the Western Pacific early and I was in the Philippines and in Hong Kong and places that I listened to ha the, the stories about the has and have nots, the elites uh, and those without. And I think I've heard more about the has and have nots and the elites in our country in the last four or five years than I have my whole life. That's a real issue and that's something I think that the leaders in the country have to figure out how to address. And part of that is where are we going to come up with the resources? We're not going to fix the debt until we get it at uh, entitlements. That's just, that's just mathematically what we have to do. And there's nobody that's been very courageous in addressing that uh, as a way ahead. How does this resource issue look from your perspective, General? Well, I think that the amount we spend on defense should not be a litmus test for patriotism. I think that it's how we spend the money. But it's actually easier for people to vote more money than it is to make tough decisions on how we spend the money. Right. Because that starts to step on people's equities. And so I think as we look at reform inside the entire government, but particularly in the Defense Department, the way we acquire things, how we interface, have got to be changed. Because if we just constantly put money against the problem, at some point you may solve the problem in that, but we won't be nearly as efficient as we have to. And I would argue that in today's world, because things are changing so fast, you don't buy things and then have them useful 50 years later. The B-52 is the exception. But most of the, many of the programs we used in Iraq didn't exist when the war started. I had one predator for part of a day when I first took over Joint Special Operations Command, and yet we relied on them two years later. Same with mine-resistant uh, vehicles and whatnot. So I think that's going to be true of future wars. We're going to build it as we go, and we've got to be postured for that. Well, one thing that uh, worries me a lot is that we uh, are having a difficulty thinking through this question of priorities, uh, because if we don't if we don't have endless resources, then we have to we have to assign some kind of priorities, or we're not going to give it the focus it needs. Uh, do either of you have any thoughts about this priority question and where we ought to be placing it in in the military at the moment? I think you start prioritizing the army, and then you you go down. <laughs> and actually, I'm a big supporter of that. <laughs> um, long, not, not that long ago, but 10 years ago. I mean, I came to believe as a naval officer at one point in time, you know, I used to fret because we couldn't get resources. Uh, and the game in town is go get somebody else's, don't give up yours. But I actually have, I really do believe that the health of the United States military depends on the health of the United States Army. The Army is the center of gravity for our military. It always has been. Uh, and so we, ha so we all need to work together to make sure that, that the Army does well in the future. And I think if it does well, others will follow. But what's happening right now is classic in the sense the budget's tight. So all the services recede to their foxholes. They put up their barriers. They, you know, they point all their weapons outward for anybody trying to come and get their money. And that's a fool's game because uh, people will play us off each other and we'll lose. Uh, and Congress can do that very well as well. I think all the services together, particularly with what we've learned in these wars about joint war fighting, uh, there's a real opportunity. Uh, we, we have enough money in the Defense Department. Uh, there's a huge amount of waste there. It is incredibly bureaucratic. It is incre incredibly du du duplicative. We have twice as many civilians in the Defense Department as we had roughly in about 2000. We're just spending way too much in that regard. That's, that's easily said, changing that is, uh, is a huge, huge challenge. So, but we've, we, have, we have to, in the circumstances that we face, get this right and make changes. Otherwise, we have a chance of becoming somewhat irrelevant, uh, the, the larger uh, defense establishment. I, I'd like to jump on, too, about defense. Uh, last June, 11 months ago or 10 months ago, on a Tuesday, we buried uh, my father. He, had, he was about 89. He'd spent a career in the military. We buried him in Arlington, where my mother already was. The next day, we buried my father-in-law. And he was a career soldier, and they buried him about 35 feet apart. The day my father died, four of his grandsons were in Afghanistan. And we postponed the, the burial until then. When we got to the funerals on both sides, I have four brothers, all served in the Army. My sister married a soldier. My wife's family, all her three brothers were in the Army. Obviously, she married me. Her sister's a widow of a soldier. And that sounds good. It's a great story. It sort of goes. But that's not good. Because in reality, 
a pretty small part of America is represented. And so when we make the decision to go to war, it is the military is sort of that thing who chose to be in. And every time I would go to little bases in Afghanistan, I would run into the sons or daughters of friends of mine who were platoon sergeants or platoon leaders. And again, it was very comfortable because I knew them in grade school and high school. But that's not good because when America looks at its military, it should be looking at a mirror of itself. It should be every zip code, every part of society because that's the way we need to think about our responsibility and decisions. And, and I think as much as money, prioritizing how we man the force and how we represent ourselves is key. Well, it might, there might be something to this. They chose an army brat to be the, uh, the moderator for this discussion. So on that point, because uh, having lived in any number of army posts, I was born in Fort Knox, as a matter of fact, um, I have worried a lot about uh, this kind of caste system that's developing. Would uh, either of you support uh, reinstitution of the draft? I, I actually, uh, and I think, I think we both probably have views on this. What I have learned, having been through the, the time I was uh, serving two administrations in, in two, really three wars, uh, and the, sort of the politics that are there, is that I actually believe, uh, and my Army friends will kill me for this, but I actually believe there's a big debate right now how big the Army should be. We were at 485,000. When we started in Iraq in 2003, we got it up to uh, theoretically about 580. We never actually got there. Uh, but we're coming back down into the high 480s uh, to, a, to an end strength number of about 450,000. I actually think that number, and this is, this is somewhat arbitrary, but we need to take it down to about 350. The active duty army needs to be about 350,000. Has nothing to do with the quality of the force, because it's the best force I've seen since I was commissioned in the late 60s. There's no question about that. But what didn't happen in Iraq in 2003 is we didn't have a raging debate as a country about whether we were going to go do this. And, we, and one of the reasons we didn't have that is we didn't have kids in every household or every neighborhood that were going to be going to war. And we didn't have families uh, and, and communities that were in the middle of that debate. So if you get to 350,000 or so, you actually could put 100,000 troops somewhere. We haven't been very good about predicting where we'd go how long we'd stay or how big the footprint will be uh, since uh, for certainly the last 20 or 30 years. But if we put 100,000 somewhere, we could do that with an active duty force and support it, but you couldn't sustain it over a long period of time. That would then cause the president and the country to have to call up a half a million kids from neighborhoods, black and white, uh, poor and rich all over the country. That requirement would generate a debate about is this a time to go to war? And that's what was missing in 2003, and, it, and that's what we don't have. I can tell the same kind of story Stan did about families who do this. My two kids were both uh, in the Navy, et cetera, and it, went, it goes on and on. America has been able to watch these wars from afar, get on with their lives, and not be, not be fully engaged into outcomes, into decisions, and to outcomes. That's a big change. I recognize if we do this, the arguments will be, you won't be as ready. Uh, it'll take longer to get going. That's worth the trade-off, from my perspective, to get the American people into the fight. And they weren't in these wars. Great. I have to clap um, on that one. Thank you very much. Do you, do you I have assume anything? this is off the record. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just no. agree. No, no, that's fine. Well, uh, looking at uh, the many opportunities uh, or uh, certainly uh, places that require our attention, both diplomatic and military, uh, how would you assign a priority to those? Uh, may I, let's put it this way. What keeps you up at night? If you were to uh, share with us your 3 o'clock in the morning uh, worry, uh, which of all of these crises uh, is pivotal for you? They're they're very different. If you ask me what the greatest threat, uh, Admiral Mullen mentioned the debt. I worry about education in America because we don't get that right. You can't fix the problem long term. And it takes a long time to fix education. So the one I really worry about is we're going to undereducate ourselves. Only about 30% of all young people are eligible to enlist in the military right now. And that's shocking. 70% of young people, for a variety of reasons, can't. So that's, that's a bit concerning. The places in the world that worry me are the ones that we can't hold at risk. 
Russia does worry me. They're the biggest single. North Korea is sort of that back block, uh, black box. But they are a nation you can hold at risk. The ones that I worry about the most are those things which can't be deterred. They're the terrorist groups or the non-state actors simply because there's no way to have a rational uh, engagement with them. And with the democratization of technology now, everyone has access to precision strike. Everyone has access to cyber. Everyone has access potentially to weapons of mass destruction. And so the, their barrier to entry is so much lower than it used to be that I worry most about those, although they won't defeat us, they will just harm us. So top five for me that keep me awake, one is the debt, two is uh, K through 12 education. It's not we are going to be undereducated, we are undereducated, and the numbers keep dropping every year. We've been talking about this problem for 30 years. Uh, there are certainly efforts to fix it, but it's got to be through the public school system. That's where all our, the massive num majority number of kids that we have go to school. Um, and, and we're going to wake up one morning and wonder what happened, and the answer is going to be staring us in the face. The third is the political paralysis in Washington, and I just think that that's been out there for me for years. Uh, I used to say before this election cycle, uh, people would say, oh, well, how's it going to end? I believe in the system, and it's a great system in a great country. It's not going to end until we, quote, unquote, throw the bums out. We threw them out in 08. That happens after every eight years. We threw them out in 10. We threw them out in 14, nothing's happened. This is a throw them out election, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, now, I'm not overly enthused by the, how it's being manifested uh, in terms of uh, you know, what you see in the campaign, but I think that's it. The fourth one, fourth one for me is cyber. I actually think cyber is existential and that people need to know a lot more about it than they do, particularly line leaders who, who, who hire the people, put in resources and make policies. Uh, and then the fifth one for me are veterans and their families. We've asked them to do so much. Uh, there are 25 million or so. I always want to put a plug in for those veterans from the forgotten war, and that's Korea. We've, we're, we're right now, we're jumping from World War II vets who are passing away rapidly to Vietnam vets. And I'm a Vietnam vet as well, and that's fine. I do not, we're forgetting, literally, the, those from the forgotten war, and we shouldn't do that but we don't take very good care of them. There are 25 million of them. What's interesting about that is they actually have immediate family members or extended family members that get to 100 million people in our country. That's almost a third of the population uh, of our country, and yet we don't take good care of them. So that, those are the things that keep me up. I mentioned uh, geostrategically Putin and Russia, Iran. Those are the two at the top of my list. Big gap. Then you get to ISIS. I think ISIS is gonna go away at some point. I think terrorism is gonna be around for a long time. It is now, uh, it is now uh, uh, spreading, if you will, and we need to deal with that, the homemade, the, the, the homegrown stuff as well. Uh, those, are the, those are kind of the top uh, of my list in terms of concern. Certainly, I talked about China. North Korea is another one that we're gonna have to deal with. But there's a big break for me between Russia, Iran, and the rest. Well, um, all the, uh, the issues on your, both of your lists uh, would certainly require some kind of leadership. Um, could you say something from your perspective uh, about what I think we'd all regard as a leadership crisis in this country? And, and why, speculate if you will. Let's, let's start with you, General, um, since uh, Admiral Mullen already touched on it a bit. But what do you think is the reason we don't have the kind of uh, leaders uh, in this country, actually, frankly, globally, that we used to have? I think there are a lot of factors, but one of the big ones is we've created an environment in which it's difficult to lead. Complex environments are hard anyway, but we have, if you look at CEOs held a quarterly uh, performance and whatnot, it's hard to take a long-term view. But also, we've just got a hateful environment. Part of that's fed by the media, part of that's fed by the political process, and it's not new. If you go back to the dirtiest election in American history, it was probably 1800. But at the same time, we've created this maelstrom in which anyone who steps into it is going to be impacted in a way that really causes a lot of people to avoid it. And then we talk about performance in leadership positions. We have made compromise a very difficult position to take because you are viewed as weak. We've gerrymandered our political districts so that 
most elections are contested primarily in the primary, and that pulls both left and right, further left and right, and so you don't have contested general elections in the majority of cases, which produces a more polarized uh, Congress, which of course feeds the problem. And people are incentivized to do things to get themselves reelected on a very uh, uh, personal sense, and that's rational behavior, but cumulatively it's irrational because we can't do the system of government upon which we rely. There are very few that are willing to put their jobs on the line from my perspective. We, Stan and I have dealt with dictators and strong men all over the world and we've always criticized them for their, for their ability to stay in power, it's how they think, it's what they actually wake up and focus on every single day, survival. In Middle East is one example, there are certainly other places. But in, in ways there's a survival, stay in power aspect of our political system right now and I've talked to a number of uh, uh, politicians in Washington over the years who basically are captured by this or they have no future and they have to make that decision. Uh, so it's much, more, uh, it's much more about getting reelected than it is actually getting elected to do something, taking a stand which may jeopardize your future, which is done on the toughest issues very, very rarely, uh, in which case we just continue to, I used to think I used to think gridlock was bad. Gridlock, uh, give me gridlock, because we're so far beyond gridlock into paralysis and inability to deliver because of the system that we actually have voted for. And I'm struck in this presidential election by one statistic, that out of the 50 states, 32 of them are real blue or real red. You probably won't see much advertising in those states about the presidential election. Out of the remaining 18, 10 lead, 10 lean red or 10 lean, lean blue pretty hard. So we're down to eight states and some five, for seven, five to seven percent of the population, uh, voting population in those eight states, and you would know what they are, you hear about them all the time, they're gonna elect the President of the United States. Is that right? I thought it should be, shouldn't it be a 50 state election? Can I throw in another aspect of this? Because politics aren't all people who are elected. Uh, there is political pressure in places like Washington, D.C. that puts insidious, and I use that term very carefully, pressure on other members to act a certain way or to not do certain things. I watched Admiral Mullen when I was the director of the Joint Staff, and shaping the role of the chairman of the Joint, Chaff, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff was a really difficult thing because there are pressures to have you not do certain things, have you do other certain things, and you know, sort of the fiber of you wants to get along. You want to be a team player and do what people want, but in reality, your role has to be one that shows some courage, one that shows the ability to, to stand up and say, this is what the chairman should do. It was a real lesson for me to watch you do that because the wind is blowing hard and you get in the Oval Office and it blows even harder and it's, it's really tempting to do that. And so I got to watch that and I guess I would, so I would say it goes beyond just those elected officials, it really takes a lot from others as well. Well, that's a very good point. Well, um, this has been such an interesting um, set of comments that I think I have to ask the natural next question, which is um, you both have um, shown a tremendous uh, uh, grasp, actually, the problems facing this country. I'm sure every day of the week people come up and ask you if you wouldn't throw your hat in if we have a contested uh, election in either of uh, the uh, Republican convention or at the Democratic convention. How, how do you feel about the idea of having another military man as president of the United States? Stan? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I won't do that. I, I, uh, I'm asked this question and have been for the last couple of years, actually, uh, even before the present turmoil. And I've my overall take on that, and, and believe me, it's certainly the heritage of your family and and George Marshall, I mean, the, Marshall is, you know, one of my heroes, uh, and one of the main reasons was he was able, for the most part, to stay out of politics. He probably thought he did all the time. It's hard to be who he was and not be involved in politics. Uh, we, don't have, we don't have jobs in the military that train you to be the chairman. You get picked to do the job, and you bring with yourself a life's work. Uh, there's, when you show up in the, in the, in the situation room, or in the Oval Office, you're it. And you're with people that are there 
who got elected to be there that want to stay. They don't want to stay for four years, by the way. Uh, they want to stay for eight, and that's the plan that they're executing starting on day one. And it's all politics, all day, all the time. And that's the American system. I don't have a problem with that. I just think it's been taken to an extreme and become more and more difficult to let the politics go and execute the substance of what's right for America. But it's a world that I, it was, it, it was uh, it's a great country, a middle class kid from LA can get to the point where you're the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. On the other hand, when you walk into the White House, it's, a, it's the moon, it's a foreign place. It's something I haven't been uh, existed in before because of the environment. So it's something I don't know much about. It's capable of, of massacring anybody. The town is, is uh, and we don't talk about this much, but it is extraordinarily capable of executing anybody for political reasons. And we don't do that that well. That's not how we grow up. So I wonder through some of the difficulties that, that we've had as senior military officers in dealing with it, whether we would transition. Uh, I told this story to a young 28-year-old woman uh, about a year ago, out in, uh, actually was out here in California, and she absolutely took my skin off uh, because she said, we need leaders and you cannot, you cannot just take yourself out because of what you just told me. I mean, that's really the tension. More than anything else, the country and the world needs bold leaders. And right now, the people that are moving the needle, in my perspective, are Xi Jinping in China, Putin in Russia, and, and not in the right direction, by the way. And then a surprise entry to the uh, sweepstakes has been the Pope out of Rome um, because he's willing to take on tough issues and take stands. This is, not I'm not agreeing or disagreeing, uh, but we need leaders to do that. And so what Stan said earlier about the media piece, the 24-7 the, the focus, this isn't about you anymore, this is about your family. It's about everything you've touched in your life and are you willing to expose that to have it ripped up uh, and, and uh, you know, really decimated whether you can do anything about that. And I think that sums up why people, good people, won't step up and go do this for a living. Well, uniquely, uh, the, uh, the military's sole focus is on uh, what is right for the country uh, in general and, and are used as a, a important uh, tool in the toolbox for securing our national security. How do you feel about uh, a military man becoming president at this particular stage? Um, it's very interesting. I think there are some military men that I know that would be a very good president. But I would, what I would, and we spoke about this earlier, what I would not like is for people to enter the military thinking that this was a good route to be president because they would be different military officers. And you would start, to, you'd be in rooms and people would start to doubt what the chairman of the Joint Chiefs said because they'd start to say, that person's angling to position themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I, I became a senior general when Admiral Mullen was the chairman, and one of the things he counts me, he says, you don't do this very well. And he was right. Um, but the reality is, I'm not sure we want me to do it too well. Because if I spend a lot of my time and energy trying to be that, I'm not sure that we're gonna produce the, the leadership that we want. So it's a, it's a funny case. There are times when I do think there are former military that that should be called. But hopefully they don't never think about it until they are to the point they're out of service. They're if out I, of if service. I, there's, a, there's a piece of this also that drives me crazy, which <laughs> is retired military officers who speak to policy. Uh, this cat's out of the bag has been for 20 years. I tried to put it back in the bag in the barn when I was chairman. But what it does is it starts to politicize the military, which is really bad. And the town is wise enough, meaning politically wise enough, to figure out that uh, if I'm going to get criticized by you when you retire, then I'm probably not going to select you, even though you might be the best qualified for a job. So I start to put in, if I'm an administration, a political calculation about who I'm selecting as my military leaders to align their perception of where a leader may stand politically to make their life easier, which they would like, to be less independent, which they would like, and that's a really bad outcome for the country, and independent military advice, which is core to who we are, is ready. So it can be very ins insidious in terms of its effect. At a time when our military's moved along too politically, 
uh, from my perspective, and certainly that's represented in too many retired officers that stand up publicly uh, and, and, and openly criticize. And the American, the farmer in Peoria, when he sees Colonel Mullen, he doesn't know whether Colonel Mullen's active duty or not. He just sees somebody that is an expert instantly by virtue of the title Colonel, uh, and you just have to be, I think we have to be really careful. Well, thank you very much for that. Now, I think it would be um, the time now to open this up for questions. Uh, may I ask you not to start talking until uh, you get to a microphone and all of us can hear you? And uh, I think we'll take, um, it's a little difficult to see up here, but we'll take some, uh, we, have we got a question back there? Okay. Well, we, oh, there's, a, there's one in the back there. Yes, do you see? Hi, uh, Jane Harmon, recovering politician. Uh, very interesting comments. My question is about military experience uh, of members of Congress. A few, not many, have now served in Iraq and Afghanistan, and uh, that was their, their, their experience to run for Congress, and they've been elected in both parties, both women and men. Uh, what kind of leg up do you think, uh, I'm loading the question, do you think this gives members of Congress a leg up to opine about the very dangerous situations in which our country finds itself? Go ahead. It's great, it's great to see you, ma'am. Um, I, I think it's very helpful. I don't think we should assume that just because someone served in uniform that they're automatically a foreign policy expert in everything to do with the use of force. But at the same time, I think it gives them an additional range of experience. And it, and it also says something about the decisions which they may or may not have made to do some kind of service, whether it's military or otherwise, for the nation before entering. And I think it's a common experience that, that others can relate to. So I think it's very important. You know, if you go back in history, we used to have a huge percentage of our Congress were people who had served in First or Second World War, of course, the Civil War. And then we hit a period when it has gone to almost nothing, and I think the loss of that DNA really is an argument that we don't actually have diversity in Congress. We may have different sexes, backgrounds, ages, and whatnot, but you're not really re reflective of American society unless you have that healthily support as well. And I, I would agree with that. I, we've gone from whatever, 60, 70, 80, whatever it was, very large numbers, down into single digits. I'm actually encouraged by the Iraq, Afghanistan veterans who've made a decision to come and run for office and try to make a difference. And I'm hopeful that number continues to increase because I think it, it does add great value. It doesn't mean you can't do it without it because there are an awful lot of good congressmen and women who, who will focus on this even without the background and will learn. And it's our responsibility as a military to engage them, but I certainly think it, think it helps if they have that background. I'd, I'd throw an additional fact I got the other day. Diversity is very important, and diversity is, of course, all kinds of things. When Brown versus the Board of Education was decided in 1954, seven of the nine justices had military experience. Now, all of the justices with different race and, and gender backgrounds are all essentially professional uh, judges through their career, and I think all went to Ivy League schools. So in reality, how much diversity is that? Yeah. compared. That's a very good point. Do we have another question? Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's uh, Flight Attendant Jane Pickersgill, Royal Air Force, currently serving with the US Navy. Uh, you touched on earlier improving efficiency in the joint arena uh, between the branches of the US military. Most of the operations we go on nowadays are coalition operations. How would you improve efficiency as a coalition, and where does that begin? Um, in mass. Afghanistan, I had a coalition of 46 nations uh, military, and that is a challenge. Napoleon's famous quote was, they asked him what foe he would most like to face, and he said a coalition. <laughs> um, <laughs> it wasn't nearly that bad, but what I would tell you is, when you are part of a coalition, you have to become like a piece in a puzzle, and you must fit into the big picture. And what happens too often is coalitions come, and each organization or nation wants to do what they're good at or what they like or what they're resourced for, 
and the pieces of the puzzle don't fit together. And so I think that if we're serious about coalitions, part of that is letting go of the side of the pool, changing what you do, your own equities and stakeholders to be a better team player. But it's, it's a tall order to ask. And, and what I learned about that is uh, in, in those 40 plus countries, uh, there are probably in any given day 10 to 15 governments that are coalition governments that are hanging on by a thread by their commitment to put forces small or big into Afghanistan or into Iraq before that. And the politicization of those militaries tied to that was something you had to deal with all the time. That said, and it's back to my sort of 350,000 comments, in the end, the military is a necessary but not sufficient part of whatever the solution is gonna be. Diplomacy is a necessary but not sufficient. In the end, these things get solved politically. And so we in the military have to deal with some real uncomfortableness, if you will, or squishiness, or no, you know, they may not be that good, but the political capital that comes from country X, Y, or Z is huge, so you're willing to take that in and try to make it work. There's a couple up here, too. Admiral Mullen, you said Iran was your second most scary uh, opponent after right. uh, Russia. Could you explain why? As an outsider, I see Pakistan with weapons already, unstable government. I see Saudi Arabia, Wahhabi extremism supporting ISIS. And yes, there was a period where Iran took a number of Americans hostage, but I haven't seen an active um, effort by Iran, and I'd be very interested in understanding why you see that as the second most dangerous place. So I'm, my perspective on this, and, and to be clear, I'm someone that supported the nuclear agreement because uh, I think there's a, I, there is a path there possibly for a peaceful outcome in Iran and in that part of the world. Uh, it's a very, very difficult path. It's a very tough issue. And it wasn't a, you know, it wasn't a hundred to zero vote on the part of myself. Uh, but I am, uh, I am uh, petrified of the regime. I, I led in, the, in a military where I lost an awful lot of Americans. I know the hardliners that are in that country. Uh, I know, and they are, uh, they, they have a long-term view of the, the uh, country, uh, or sorry, the state of Persia, the history, the civilization, and their implementation of that scares me to death. Um, and I, I actually believe that if Iran wants a nuclear weapon, they're going to get a nuclear weapon. Uh, I have some hope that Rouhani is the right guy. Recent elections were, were uh, somewhat constructive in that regard, but I think he's got a long way to go. And it's a young population that's actually looking for a much different life. I understand that. But until they stop developing the technology, the missile technology that continues to threaten, until they uh, actually uh, stop the, uh, the uh, enhanced level or the level of, of terrorism which they support, uh, until they show that they want to be a legitimate uh, international country on the international stage from a responsibility standpoint, they have an opportunity to create uh, incredible turmoil in that part of the world and that sort of, uh, that's, and, and so in a world that, I'm sorry, in a part of the world that is uh, so tumultuous anyway, I think there's just a huge danger for them. Mostly, just like Russia, mostly it's the regime leadership is why I put them in that category. Same thing with uh, Putin uh, uh, in Russia. I, I'd like to just follow up on that for a second, get uh, both of your perspectives on um, how you see this short-term thinking versus long-term thinking. Do you think this uh, puts the United States at a disadvantage because we have become a nation of short-term thinkers? Well, I think we've become a world of short-term thinkers, and certainly we lead that. And I, I mean, it, one of the things that strikes me, and this is known to most of you because you're global people, is it's not only Americans that are following these elections. Uh, the world follows these elections, uh, every presidential election, sometimes much more closely than the American people, and particularly this year. So they are asking 
about Mr. Trump. And they are asking about where this goes with great concern. Uh, I think the number one thing missing in Washington, we talked about leadership, uh, uh, but the number one thing missing is any kind of strategy, any kind of vision for the country. Tell me where we're going so I know where I will be able to fit in. And I think that's a global problem. Uh, and if the, strategy is the, if the strategy is to come home and to isolate and to do it all ourselves, I personally think that's a failed strategy. I don't think that'll work in a global world. But if that's it, okay, at least I know where I stand and what I'm supposed to do given that as an example. Maybe more than any other country, the United States not only has a problem with short-term thinking, but also because we've got this wide breadth of things we think about. We think about North Korean for a month or so, and then we don't pay any attention for eight months, and then we think about another crisis. And so as a consequence, if you try to centrally control that from inside the U.S. government, it's almost impossible to do because you're multitasking, and then you come back to it, and you've it's been on the back burner and it tried to spin the pie plates on the wooden stakes, it doesn't work. The world is such now we are gonna to have to, as a system of governance, we are gonna to have to decentralize handling a lot of these down to our diplomats and leaders more cl closer to the problem and give a little bit more trust. At the same time that there's this great temptation to pull it all forward because it's on the news every night, you just can't do it justice in a uh, micromanaging system. Great. We have another question. If, uh, if Russia is your biggest concern, what would, what would be your strategy to address uh, U.S. relations with Russia? I just think we're, we're very slow to the switch to engage Putin specifically. I described the characteristics, uh, the situation, I think. Uh, actually, I just read 40 or 50 pages in the latest edition of Foreign Affairs on Russia and, and the future. And, and quite frankly, I'm not sure I agree, even with some of the Russian experts uh, that say, uh, that, that, that make statements about why Putin is who he is. He's very isolated, very few people advise him. He's somewhat ad hoc. Uh, he's got huge challenges, and he's a very popular guy. I believe he's gonna run that country for another 20 years. I know, I, I think he'll get elected in two years, or reelected. And then I think you'll figure out a way to run the country after that, even after that six years runs out. You've seen the security changes just in the last week or two, uh, the kinds of internal security that he's now putting in place, for example. But he's a guy, I, every, I have a great relationship with my Russian counterpart. There wasn't a conversation I'd had with him that on paragraph two didn't get to terrorism. The reason that my view, one of the big reasons that Russia's in Syria is because they do not want that to become a safe haven for terrorists from around the world because it runs right up to Chechnya, which they are, and there are a lot of Chechnyans actually fighting in Syria right now. They are petrified of that. So there's common ground there. There's common ground on economics. There's con common ground on, on energy. Geopolitically, he gets a vote. And every big vote in the world, he gets a vote. So he's gonna vote on Iran, he's gonna vote on Syria, et cetera. He was coming to Syria I knew that four or five years ago. How was that going to be manifested? I didn't know, anticipate that he physically was going to show up like he did and surprise everybody. But he's going to be engaged. And I think we need to engage him and engage him uh, and create space for negotiations and outcomes. We don't have to be great friends, but there's an opportunity, I think, to do that on areas of common interest, and there are things that we're going to disagree on. But if we leave him alone, it's gonna get worse, and my worst nightmare is that continued isolation will eventually force him to reach for those strategic nuclear weapons, which is a disaster for the world. Additionally, he and China are not particularly great friends historically. Uh, we have put him in a position to put, we're pushing him closer and closer to China, and I think a, a solid, welded relationship between China and Russia for the next 50 or 60 years isn't good for us and it isn't good for the world. Another question over here. What recommendations do you have to break the paralysis in Washington? Susan? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you both live in the Washington area too, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not a political type, but I'd start by making a requirement that every second Saturday there's a, a uh, congressional 
meeting that requires all of them to be there, and it would last about five minutes. But what it would do is it would force all of them to spend two weekends of the month in D.C. And the reason I say that is because the average congressperson goes home or comes Monday night or Tuesday morning and leaves Thursday evening. So they're about three days, and they have to go home. It's not because they're lazy. They go home because they've got to tend to their home district, and they've got to politic, and they've got to do all the things they do to survive. If we took part of that away and didn't allow that to happen as much, I think we could get back a first step toward getting people to at least know each other and start to talk. And then we've got to build other things that reward some kind of compromise. But I don't have a, a magic you know, silver bullet on that. I just know if we can't get there, you'll be talking at each other forever. You have to have leaders that are willing to reach across the aisle. And that's, to me, going to be the sign whether it changes or not. If we don't have leaders that start doing that, then nothing's going to change until they do. If I could just add to that, I think the other thing we need to do is to uh, make certain that uh, we change our definition of strong leadership. Uh, we've decided that uh, strong leadership is digging your heels in and not budging, yeah. Yeah. Uh, when in fact, uh, really all the great leaders of the past were, were great at co uh, finding that common ground and right. compromising. Yeah. Well, think of your grandfather, Susan. I mean, as he led the coalition across Europe, that was big personalities with very different right. uh, goals in many cases, and the genius was in making it all work. Yeah. The plan didn't have to be elegant. Yeah. You had to keep the team together. Yeah, yeah. To keep the team together. Do we have another question? Mm -hmm. I'm David Nuss. Thank you for your comments. Um, I wonder if you could help us better understand China's ability and intent in the South China Sea. And in particular, do you have any thoughts on how today compares with China's external actions in the 1960s and 70s? Uh, sorry, what's the second part? Um, do you have any thoughts on how the situation today compares with China's actions outside of China in the 1960s and 70s? You want to take on that maritime question there? No. <laughs> Um, I'm actually really bothered by what is happening in the South China Sea, East China Sea as well, by the way, but more visible is the South China Sea. And I think it is a product, and it's different from the 60s and the 70s in the sense that China is a, an emerging great power, growing. Uh, it's clearly generating a naval force of some significance and, uh, and substance in terms of numbers. They have a ways to go yet in terms of quality from my perspective, but the numbers are there increasingly, that their strategy, and it goes back to what either their stated strategy or in execution figuring out what their strategy is, it is to basically own that nine line diagram that they drew fairly arbitrarily in 1947, I think, uh, around the South China Sea and say this is ours against all the international norms. What is, I think, what I'm, what I'm hopeful about is that uh, China very much is trying to, is learning to conform to international norms. Uh, owning the South China Sea is not an international norm. Uh, it, that, is a, that is a free and open international body of water through which anybody needs to be able to travel. The danger is that it's a huge part of the 21st century commerce. We have to have stability there. We as a country and other nations as well have to have a continued presence there to let them know that this won't stand. What China is actually doing is driving its, its neighbors away from them. So the Vietnams, the Philippines, the Singapores, uh, those that have to live in the neighborhood, if you will, are actually coming closer to the West. But China is establishing by virtue of its uh, its patrols, its naval patrols, its Coast Guard patrols, a new reality in terms of what they think they own out there, which really concerns me greatly in terms of Scarborough Shoals in particular. And we have to not let that stand. And that needs to be solved politically. I mean, there are other ways. It can be manifested in other ways. I don't think it will break into a large conflict. That won't mean we won't have pretty serious incidents over the course of the next several years. Uh, they are trying, someone, uh, someone, I can't remember who it was, used the example, what China is doing in its local waters is what the United States of America did in the early 1900s when we took over the Caribbean, when we started to develop our Navy. We tried to control our local waters, and then that, un that, that comfort level then gave us an opportunity 
to start projecting power around the world, which is what we did in World War I, and obviously much more so in World War II. A lot of people follow us. Sometimes we don't think about that, because history to us was a couple weeks ago. But to China and to other parts of the world, they look back. They First of all, they follow us. And this is one example. And history is really important to them. And, and we oftentimes forget that at our peril as well. You agree? Well, uh, we have just a, uh, a few more minutes. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Question over here. I'd like to start off by thanking the panel for their service and their family's service to the country. Thank you. Personally, I have a lot of admiration for career military people. I have no admiration for career politicians. Uh, do you have an opinion on term limits for Congress? And my opinion is we ought to have them. And I mean, you can argue about what the numbers are. Clearly, the current system isn't working. And I'm, I'd be happy to see term limits be put in place. And then we'll see how that goes. I think you have to. Uh, we've just stacked it for incumbency now, but the nature of the beast is so I think you have to. Well, I, I know I can uh, speak for the whole audience in, in thanking both of these extraordinary leaders for their perspectives on the challenges facing our country in a rapidly changing international environment. And I think uh, we have time for just a, a concluding remark from both of you. Well, I just believe, and, and I'm, I'm I really appreciate that you would take the time to come and listen. Uh, we're, we're in a time and place where everybody in America needs to reach in. And in particular, I mean, I go back to this, uh, this growing split between those that have and those that don't. And we need, to, we, we need to be in the trenches to really understand that space, to understand what really is going on in the, those that don't have a future, whether it's middle class whose wages don't go up or the underclass and the, the poor who have no future. We have to create. We're, we're a country of hope. We have always been a country of hope. That the hope candle, if you will, is going out. And it's out in too many places in the country. And it's up to all of us, not just the government leaders or the business leaders. It's up to all of us to focus on that aspect of who America is so that we can so that we have a future that is we're all proud of for our kids and our grandkids. So I'd urge you to absorb what you do over the last two or three days here, but then take it back and lead in that very, very challenging space. Yeah, and just to follow that, I think Charles Murray in, in Coming Apart wrote all the things pulling America apart. I think we need to look for linking experiences which bring generations together. Because right now, the meaning of citizenship doesn't have the same meaning, in my view, that it might have 40 or 50 years ago. It's not just your rights and your privileges. It's actually your responsibilities. But I think we've got to help next generations have experiences which build that. And they have to go across zip codes, across races, across all the income levels, anything that links us. World War II did that. But we don't want to have another World War II to bring 16 million people in uniform together and, and unified on something. We need to find other ways to do it, but we need to do it right away. Well, thank you both for participating today. Thanks, Susan. Thank you for Thank you. Thank you.